All right, folks, thanks so much for joining us this morning for our webinar, Powering Instant Data Recovery for the Ransomware Age. We're excited to welcome our partner, Veeam, uh, for this morning's webinar. Uh, oh, one quick, before we, before I introduce our presenters, uh, one quick housekeeping item. If you have any uh, questions uh, throughout the events, you can just drop them in the little Q&A. You'll see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to drop any questions there, and we'll get to them at the end of the, uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. But um, without further ado, I want to welcome uh, today's presenters. Uh, from VAST, I want to welcome Howard Marks. Welcome, Howard. Thank you, Boone. And, uh, and from our partner, Veeam, Dave Russell. Welcome, Dave. Hey, good to be here with you guys. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, Dave, let me hand it off to you. I, I know you have some uh, some survey stats you wanted to share with us. Yeah, you know, we, we've all been hearing scary things, you know, Howard, for a couple of years about ransomware, and it can feel a little bit like, is the news really that bad? And unfortunately, I'm kind of here to say it really is that bad, but it's not just me saying it. At Veeam, we do a lot of our own research, and what we've done here, the largest ever uh, research in the history of backup 4,200 global respondents, 28 countries. We've been doing this for a few years now. What we asked them is just simply over the last three years that we've been asking this, 2020, 2021, at the very end of 2022, what were all of the things that took down your server unexpectedly? And check all that apply. Those are the longer bars. And then the shorter bars that you see kind of stacked there are what was the most impactful? And, you know, Howard, this is, you know, you and I have been around in backup and storage for a, a day or two, a let's put it that way. <laughs> and all of the things that we always worried about in the late 1980s and 90s and 2000s and 2010s and now, they still happen. So before we even get into numbers, if you just look at the, the items on the left-hand side, Storage hardware still fails every now and then. Networking still goes hiccup every now and then. An admin makes a mistake around a patch every now and then. So you get the idea that, you know, all the things that could go wrong in the past, despite redundant power supplies and better mean time to failure components, stuff still goes south. And oh, by the way, now we add bad actors, because let's just say those were good humans that sometimes did bad things and good technology that sometimes didn't behave so good. But now we've got bad actors that are actually trying to get us. And that is actually, boom, what rose to the top. For the last three years, tied for number one in terms of most frequent and most impactful has been cyber, ransomware, in other words. And, you know, if we go to the next slide, I'll just kind of throw a few more stats at you. Year over year, this year, 2023, we asked, again, this 4,200 organizations in the last year, the last 12 months, did you suffer a cyber event? And Howard, 85% said they did, only 15%. I mean, I don't know if you go to Vegas a lot. I know you're on the road in Austin today. Maybe you're going to swing by Vegas on your way home. Your odds are better in Vegas, actually, at playing blackjack. I mean, there, there may be some confirmation bias that people who are attacked are more likely to fill out the survey, but 85% is still really scary. It, it, it is a scary number, right? I mean, literally the odds are not in your favor. And year over year, it went down. In the prior year, 24% said that they didn't suffer an event, or at least they didn't know. Let's be fair. They didn't know. <laughs> Maybe there was dwell time involved. Maybe it was a multinational and, you know, they're, they're in Italy and they didn't know what happened in Australia, right? But it got worse year over year. And the left-hand side, Boone, is where it gets worse. You know, and, you know, I've got my HP calculator at the ready, but I'll do the algebra for you. On average, thousands and thousands of people said 39%, so almost... Four out of 10 servers, applications, whatever you want to say, that got either destroyed or encrypted. And then, Howard, when they went to their backups, it was kind of nearly a toy, coin toss, rather. You know, they only got 55% of their data back from trying to recover. If you take 45% loss of data from the recovery times the 39% that was bricked or encrypted, 
That means per event, 18%, you know, nearly one out of five files, one out of five applications were lost. And, and you know, Boone, for the sake of brevity, I didn't put the maybe even final punchline on, you know, statistic on here, but the most frequent response was that thousands of thousands of organizations said they got hit either two or three times in a 12 month period. 49% or almost half of 4,200 people said they got attacked successfully two or three times. And Howard, I'll, I'll toss it over well, to you. Just, but if That disproves the old saw about locking the barn door after the horse is gone. Because <laughs> they're yeah. coming back. You know, yeah. one, once you've been, you know, once they've gotten what they want from you, you know, you go on the dark web victim list and that you get passed around. Yeah, it's a sad reality and, you know, don't want to pick on people in IT who are working as hard as they can. And it's usually not the people that are the problem. I mean, if you talk to administrators, they'll tell you, look, we've been meaning, we've been telling management we, we should patch these servers. We should, you know, help, help educate people not to fall victim to, you know, email phishing attacks. We should probably, you know, do multi-factor authentication. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's not like the cooks in the kitchen don't know what they should be doing. It's we what I like to call digital hygiene. We should the executive vice president who opened a phishing email, who opened the test phishing emails hard so he doesn't do it again because just going, you shouldn't have done that from IT doesn't work. Yeah. So, you know, the, my point really, Boone, of this setup was that, you know, it's not just a couple of people saying that this is a bad thing, that it could happen to you. It's that overwhelmingly the numbers in the reality is not in your favor. So, Howard, I like to say, you know, this is not being pessimistic. This is being realistic, right? As engineers, you plan for the edge case, right? That's your job, right? You, of course, you have to make sure that main path works appropriately. But then if you're a proper engineer, what you do is you make sure all the branch conditions, all the edge cases are appropriately taken care of and handled. So you have to plan for breach, which in my mind leads us into what we're going to talk about, which is you have to have good, reliable, fast recovery. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Murphy was an optimist. Whatever can go wrong will. And um, the thing about ransomware is that it, it changes the restore so much. In the old days, we used to talk about, oh, the whole server died and we have to restore the whole server. But in reality, 90% of what we were doing was restoring because users made mistakes. And so the, the most of the time was, you know, finding the right file to restore. And then once we made the switch from tape to hard drive based appliances, the restore was easy because it wasn't a lot of data. And the performance problems with PBBAs and large restores because reading data off a deduplicated repository is random IO and disks aren't good at random IO anymore. Um, they don't matter if you're only restoring a few megabytes. But by the time you've discovered that you've been attacked by ransomware and some of your data is encrypted, you don't have three or four encrypted files. You have thousands of encrypted files. You have whole systems where the data is simply unreliable. You don't know if it's, if it's encrypted or infected. And so you have to isolate those systems and restore not just the data you know is bad, but all the questionable data because that's much less time consuming than checking every file to see if it's infected with the malware code to infect to get you the next time. And so restore time becomes much more important. And this caught the disk-based PBBA guys on their back leg because they kept building systems around backup time. All that mattered was, can I complete my backup in the allotted window? because restores were so much smaller than backups. Now that you really have to plan for backups being as big or bigger, excuse me, for restores being as big or bigger than your backups, 
restore bandwidth becomes the determinant of how long it takes to get to the restore point, not time to first byte, which is the big advantage disk gave us over tape. Okay, yeah, I really, thanks. I really like that what you're saying there, Howard, because it used to be that you only restored, pick your percentage, but typically only three to five percent of the data that you backed up in the last year. And the trick, of course, was you didn't know which three to five percent, and you didn't know when that three to five percent right. was going to be needed. To your point, like, oh, the executive accidentally deleted a file. A drive went down, a server, you know, had the proverbial water main break above it. It was fairly isolated. But now those things still happen, as we saw, and you know, what people self-reported that the outages that went bad in the past, they still go bad. However, now cyber literally means without warning, like, you know, you may know that a hurricane is coming or that some other natural disaster is being basically telegraphing that it's headed your way. But unlike that, you don't know when cyber is going to hit. You don't know if it's over yet. <laughs> you can tell if the server is a little wet or a little crispy, that one needs to be replaced. You can't tell from cyber if you're still under attack, Boone. You, you might still have now noticed something, but you're in the midst of it. You're not through it. And literally now, Howard, it's not that 3 to 5% of data. It could quite actually be 100% of your data to your point on bandwidth and oh shoot boon three four months from now we might be going through this all over again yep you definitely don't you, you definitely have to assume that the malware is still around in your system even if it's gone idle and that's the, where it's you know i have to clean everything yep. so on the next slide we have, you know, the really real basics of what you do when ransomware attacks. And the first thing is shut it down. You know, when the system is, is encrypting your data, you'd shut down as much of it as you can. And that may mean you know, disconnecting the storage system from the rest of the network immediately so that you can't have any further damage done. Um, then you have all of the implications beyond just how fast can I restore, you know, figuring out what I need to restore, what still has malware in it. When did the attack begin so that I can start looking at my backups from before that date to assume that those copies of data are bad. And then the part people don't think about is where do I restore to? Mm. If, if you've been struck by a malware attack and you've taken your NAS or your SAN array off the network because it's infected, it's not a matter of spending an hour or two wiping it and bringing things back. Your lawyers want to get involved. The insurance company wants to get involved because that's all evidence. And so you might have law enforcement involved preventing you from accessing those systems. And even if you do, if you've got terabytes and terabytes of storage, you have to write zeros to all of it to make sure you get rid of all the bad data. And that's incredibly time consuming. So to actually recover, you need three good things. You know, first you need backups that haven't themselves been damaged. You know, the, the insidious part about ransomware and, you know, too many people think of ransomware as a virus that it's some stupid piece of code doing things because it's been pre-programmed. And too often ransomware as malware is a mechanism for someone to get into your system and then be a human actor who mm. can be much smarter than malware about hiding and doing damage when you're not looking. So you're, you know, that, so they attack the backups. They go, oh, I'm using brand, you know, I noticed you're using brand X backup software. Brand X backup software logs in as the administrator. Well, I managed to steal the password of one of your administrators so I can change the password of the administrator and now go delete all your backups because I know where they are because I know what backup software you're using. That's all the human part. So you need to have backups that no human can delete. You need to have a fast method for figuring out for every set of data, 
what the last known good point is, how close can I restore to the point where the ransomware started causing damage? And then you need a place to restore to that's fast enough to run your applications. Yeah, that, that is a great point. You know, um, I like the notion of the sort of the police line tape, you know, the yellow tape being literally stripped across your servers, if not literally, most assuredly, figuratively, where if you are fortunate enough to be able to afford cyber insurance, which is not a given these days, the premium costs and the out clauses are just getting really quite amazing. As I've been L reading interesting goes. things about the out clauses. It's like, yes, this doesn't cover you for any of the things you actually need to be covered for. Yeah, really yeah that's a really, that's a good point. I mean, literally the whole reason that we purchased cyber insurance was for a cyber event. And if you read the fine print, increasingly, not only is this expensive, but it doesn't cause payment in the case of a cyber event more often than not, if you really get down to it. But even that, you know, Howard, that's a bit like going to the restaurant, you get food poisoning, they say they're going to comp the meal. I mean, okay, that's fine. But like you literally suffered a consequence as a result of it, the, the monetary aspect didn't fully make you whole. And Boone, as you know, wow. if you're without data in this day and age, it doesn't matter, you know, what business you're in, where you're located, how, if you're a big business, a small business, everybody's a data-driven business at this point, especially since these pandemic years when people have had to pivot to a lot of online activities. They do a lot of things now digitally. And, you know, again, I just go back to per instant, if you're losing 18% of your data, our, nobody has 18% of production data that they can afford to lose every well, single ransom. Murphy, di Murphy dictates that that 18% is going to include some small amount from every workload so that you're just dead in the water. Because... That's a good point. It may not be evenly you know, spread across. To your point about bad actor came in, bad actor didn't randomly choose a file. They targeted exactly what they wanted to go after for maximum impact. Well, I think the other thing we have to point out is that all the things we're talking about about ransomware apply to the administrator who you're just found out he's going to get fired and decided to destroy all your systems. That, you know, we're talking about protection against bad human actors, regardless of who those are. I think uh, I think we're all totally terrified at this point. So I'm hoping at some point in this webinar we're gonna we're gonna hear about how we can uh, avoid these kind of attacks. Uh, okay, advance the slide. We'll move on to the happy part. <laughs> nice Mars attacks reference, though. By the way, I, I now got to put that Thank on you. my rewatch queue. I was gonna ask. I'm not a pop, I'm not a pop I'm not a big. I, I you know I'm a movie guy, but uh, yeah. you know I don't know everything. So I was gonna ask you know who this terrifying villain is here. Oh, yeah, it's uh, Mars attacks. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, that is exactly what most bad actors look like. <laughs> <laughs> that is terrifying. That's terrifying. <laughs> so, you know, if we think about a little bit of a, I'll call it a decision framework, Howard, you know, what, what, if you're a data center professional, you know, what is it that you need? And I, you know, we could probably come up with a list of 30 things, but let's just distill it down to a few as what I would call essentials. First and foremost, kind of in the middle, it has to work. I know that sounds, um, you know, very simplistic, but that same survey I referenced, 4,200 people, believe it or not, Howard said the number one reason that they would switch their backup solution is to improve reliability. That's a lot like saying, why do you want to buy a new hammer? Well, the hammer doesn't hammer very well. So I think I may be in the market for one that can do, you know, a hammer task. That's amazingly incriminating, I'll call it, on the state yeah, of the industry. The extent to which people are willing to live with the unreliable system for yeah. backup always amazes me. It's kind of like, no, no, this is the one thing that has to work right. You know, because it's the line of last resort. It, that is, yeah, exactly well said. You know, and I don't know, you know, we might have some people internationally viewing, but in the United States, particularly Northern California, Sacramento area, a couple of years back. They suffered, I think they still are under heavy fire watch, but there was a series of very, very serious fires. And there was one data center professional, it was, he was a CIO. And he said, you know what scares me? I look out the window and I can see the flames. But what scares me more is I'm not going to push the button. And what he meant by that is I'm not going to declare a disaster 
because he had less confidence in his disaster recovery plan than he did in waiting out what he could visually see was eminent danger to his data center, his data, and his therefore his business. But you're so concerned about all the money, all of the human activity spent around failover and disaster recovery that you don't want to enable that process. You don't want to enact down that path. So reliability. And you, and you get into that position because you never test. Amen. That, that, that is true. The, Why do you the, way, the only way to be confident that your recovery is going to work is because you've tested it. A backup system is worthless unless you've restored from it and you know how and you wrote it all down. Well said, well said. And, you know, I, I want to mention another one of what you might want to look for uh, in your decision framework. And you, you mentioned it in the bottom middle there, immutability. And, you know, the reality for all of this is how do you ensure that you've got clean data that hasn't been encrypted or hasn't been altered or has didn't suffer some sort of data injection that you have so far been unable to detect? You have immutable backups, and that doesn't have to be a thing for just certain businesses or for a certain amount of expense. There's a lot of ways to achieve immutability, and we're going to talk through some specifics, but immutability helps give you the confidence along with testing that you can bring back that data. And when you bring it back, you know, it should be an easy to do process. It shouldn't be, you know, at the worst time humanly possible boom, when your boss's boss's boss is either literally standing over your shoulder or they're, they're texting you every other minute. Are we up yet? Are we up yet? No, it should be something that we know with confidence we can do. We've proven it to ourselves, like Howard said. You know, we've tested it. We're we're and able we wrote to wrote a checklist. Yeah, and, and we've got a clean run book that's up to date, and then it's fast. You know, I I've gone all flash even in my own home lab now. I do have one HDD. That's actually my fifth copy of data that I have. Everything else is some form of, of flash and. Really, the cost differential, and you'll talk more about this. I don't want to steal your thunder and your area of expertise, but speed is not a luxury. Speed is actually essential. And then you know, the last bit is, you know, right tool, right task. It has to be something that's going to work well in your environment. The tools, in other words, shouldn't be changing your business process. Those tools should be working for you. And the fact that many people say, the reason they would switch the recovery solution is so they could get improved recoverability means in my mind, Howard, that the solution stack is not working for them. They're trying to adapt around a poorly configured environment. All too often, the primary technology has changed faster than the backup solution. And so they're using yesterday's backup solution to back up today's workloads. And you know that's one of the places where Veeam excels is that you, know, you were designed from scratch for the more modern workloads and so accommodate those things more easily. All right. So let me introduce VAST because I can't assume that our listeners know who we are or what we do. Um, basically VAST builds scale out all flash storage systems designed for efficiency. And so we can, deliver an all flash system from a couple of hundred terabytes to a couple of hundred petabytes um, with the cost of a disk system or lower, especially as we start talking about the very large systems because purpose-built backup appliances based on disks generally have limited scale for their data reduction realm that you a, an appliance can grow as large as that appliance grows, typically about a petabyte. But when you outgrow that and you need a second appliance, that's a second reduction realm. And while we might talk about my backups dedupe at 10 to one, that doesn't mean all the data you're backing up dedupes 10 to one. I guarantee the vast majority of your data is unique and doesn't dedupe at all. But you backed up 100 Windows VMs. That meant you backed up 100 copies of Windows. And so that dedupes 100 to 1 and makes up for it. But as soon as you say, I have four appliances I'm backing up to, that 100 to 1 went down to 25 to 1. And so your 
10 to one overall goes down to four or five to one. So the ability to have one deduplication realm that extends over an arbitrary amount of data becomes very important. But while we talk about VAST today as a backup target, it's an all flash object and storage and file system. And you can use it for all kinds of applications that need file and object access. We have guaranteed best in the business data reduction. We use very high levels of data protection, always N plus four, so we can lose four SSDs and recover from it. And we've designed the system to use the lowest cost flash and manage flashware. So that becomes not a problem for people and will support a system for up to 10 years. So you don't have the periodic, I need to replace my system and migrate all my data, or I need to send my backups to the new system and let that run until retention on the old system is over, which may be a very long time. And then of course we provide immutability through indestructible or immutable snapshots. And even better for many applications through the S3 object lock API that lets the data mover, the backup software control retention. And so you only have one point of control instead of having to manage backup jobs and snapshot policies separately. Next. So when storage companies talk about ransomware, they typically just talk about immutability because it's, you know, we prevent ransomware from corrupting your data. And that's very important. And we do that with, Va uh, with Veeam, both through the indestructible snapshots, which are what they sound like. You take a snapshot at some time or some schedule and you set a retention period and no one, including the system administrator, the root user, the next thing to a deity for your system can delete those snapshots until their retention period ends. Object lock is very similar, except that it gives control on a object by object basis to the software writing the objects. And so we can say, Veeam, write this data to us as an S3 repository, use object lock and make sure that those objects aren't deletable for 90 days. And there's just one point of control. And in general, I think that's a much better idea because I'd rather not be trying to do close correlation between, all right, this backup job is writing to this folder and that's going to finish at 4 a.m. So I'm going to take a snapshot at 5 a.m. Just becomes unwieldy. Next. And so if you compare vast, a vast system of similar size to the largest model of the leading purpose-built backup appliance, um, we get much better recovery performance because restores are random IO off of anything that's deduplicated. And being all flash, we do random IO just as well as we do sequential IO. The bigger the hard drives get in the PBBAs and therefore the lower the costs they can deliver to you, the fewer IOPS they can do. And that means the slower the restores get. Our system scales to hundreds of petabytes in a single dedupe realm, so way better than they can do. It takes up less space, it takes up less power, it costs you less dollars. And that's for the one unit. When you start talking about two and three and four, the less dollars become even more apparent. So, you know, the, well, Curtis Preston on his podcast the other day was not sure about all flash for backup. And I'll be appearing on that podcast to disprove him of that, but it's a common opinion that, you know, I can't afford flash. Um, and that's the self-fulfilling prophecy that the first generation of all flash vendors have come up with. They made systems to, to provide very, very, very high levels of performance from relatively small amounts of data because that's what you need to run your ERP system. VAST is designed to provide only two varies of performance for petabytes and petabytes of data. And so we can deliver that performance at a cost you can actually afford. Next. 
That's the point, you know, I think, Howard, that's amazing to me. I mean, again, in my personal life, the cost differential between flash and, and hard disk drive technology was quite minimal. And, you know, you get to the point where you say, you know, the, for just such a small delta, that 50x recovery performance certainly stands out of my mind because sometimes people think backup as a commodity. And I say, yeah, just like oil. Well, oil is a commodity, but don't confuse that for being not a value. It just and means, it doesn't yeah, you mean can, there isn't a difference between regular and premium. Well said, right? Octane matters. Uh, premium is is different. They're both, you know, technically gasoline, but your experience will be different. And that's just the backup side. Restore is really where it's at. And being able, Boone, to get your business back up and operational in short order versus what could be days, weeks, or longer, it's literally the difference between staying in business and putting your business at risk for an event. But just again, before you even get to that sort of dramatic you know, level, Howard, even in my own life, for literally a little bit more why not have the ability to get your data back fast when you need it? I, I love the fact that you can at Vast bring back data as fast as you can ingest it. There's not faster. a penalty, in other words. It, it's actually substantially faster. The, the traditional backup appliances uh, back up about five times faster than they restore. Uh, yeah. We restore about eight times faster than we back up. Wow. That you know, where our system is optimized for reads, and so you know we can deliver plenty of backup performance because it's an all flash system and it's hard to be slow. Um, but it's really about the re the restore performance and the read performance for real applications. So can you advance a slide, Boone? So you know, integrating Vast and Veeam is simple. You use the universal target can write to us via S3 or NFS or SMB. Um, we support all the functionality that you guys offer. And because we're doing the deduplication and data reduction on the back end, all of the management events that you might do in Veeam that would cause the incremental forever to restart with a new fresh backup, you know, you switched from doing NFS to S3, or you switched from Veeam 9 to Veeam 12, or you are reorganizing your jobs because you now have two administrators and they're going to manage different sets of jobs. All those things come out in the wash because we're reducing the data on the back end. Now, that's not to say that data reduction on the front end is valueless. You want to reduce data on the front end to manage network bandwidth so that the amount of data you're sending over the network is limited and you don't have to implement huge networks. In terms of how much data you store on the back end, if we do the data reduction, it doesn't matter how much you reduce data on the front end. And so if you have a lot of network bandwidth, you can save CPUs on the front end and turn data reduction off. If you have network limitations, you can turn data reduction on the front end on the Veeam systems on and reduce the amount of data you're sending over the network. It's all flexibility that you have for your architecture. Next slide, please. And so now we get to, okay, I've been hit by ransomware and I'm trying to figure out what I have to do. And the first thing you have to do after shut it down and stop the pain from spreading, let me not de-emphasize the first thing you do is wrap the bandage around the bleeding limb. Um, but the next step beyond that is to start figuring out what you can restore and to what point. And Veeam has a great feature for this called instant recovery. So instant recovery creates an NFS data store at the Veeam server. And the Veeam server reads data from whatever repository you've put it in, presents it as NFS to your VMware hosts, and your VMware hosts can run those applications on that NFS data store. It's great for saying, well, I have 12 backups of my domain controller, and I have to figure out which one the administrator password is the old administrator password on. 
So I have to pick one at random, restore it, see if that one is before or after the damage point and iterate through that. And instant recovery is great at that. It's only a couple of minutes to bring each VM up and see what its state is. But because the Veeam server is doing all of this fetching data from the repository and reformatting it and presenting it as the current version, it becomes a bottleneck. And the amount of compute you have in that Veeam server becomes the determination of how many VMs you can run. It's just, it's not a long, great long-term solution. It's a great figure out where you are solution. And then you wanna either storage vMotion, the running VM, or restore the VM. And part of that is that how long will each take? The restore is typically faster. So you go, I, that's the right version, shut it down, restore it in 20 minutes or run it as instant recovery and storage vMotion it for an hour or so. That's a decision you have to make. But once you figured out, okay, here's my DNS server and my Active Directory server and you know the, the six, servers I have to bring up first to get the infrastructure working at all, uh, you need to restore them someplace. And as we've already established, there may be police tape around where those data is that system used to run. Um, it wasn't a ransomware event, but I have been involved in a case where the FBI just came and took all the servers. They said, nope, this is evidence. We're taking these away. And we had to acquire new servers and new storage before we could even start the restore. And that, that was a small business and it was a small business in Manhattan. So it only took two days. But if it was a large business that needed hundreds of servers and wasn't in Manhattan where you can find almost anything at any time of day or night, that might be a week or two before you have a place to restore. And if your business is shut down for a week or two, the odds of it coming back are relatively low. Yeah, you can get away. Yeah, when I did disaster recovery planning, I used to talk to a lot of companies and they would say, we need zero RPO, zero RTO. And I would say, okay, but last January 7th, there was a big snowstorm and the mayor said people shouldn't go to work. Were you open or closed? And they say closed. I go, okay, you can survive a day then. You did survive a day but you can't survive a week. You definitely can't survive a month. And so the advantage of having a backup repository that's fast enough and efficient enough to run as your primary storage is it's always an emergency restore location. And you know we're gonna talk about that right now about I can restore to that VAST system as fast as I can write to it. And for the smallest VAST system, that's five gigabytes a second. For big VAST systems, it's hundreds of gigabytes a second. I can run from an NFS data store, my VMs just as well as I could run them on their primary, on the primary storage you're running now. And that data is all still reduced. So if I do have to restore 50 Windows VMs, I'm only storing one copy of Windows so that you don't have to have huge amounts of space available for this. Now, the point we didn't make making the slides is this is the magic bullet because you can do these restores and test. Mm. You can make sure that your restore process works. You can debug that run book. You can write the checklist so that the DR plan doesn't say, Sven, the exchange administrator will restore the exchange server when Sven's on vacation, when the ransomware hits, or from the disaster recovery point of view, Sven died in the fire. You can't have critical people. You have to take the knowledge and re reduce it to paper. Okay, electrons, we don't use paper anymore. Uh, but you have to have your process to the point where people with lower sets of skills can follow it because that's maybe the only people you have available when the emergency strikes. If you always have someplace that can be an emergency restore point, it can be the test and dev restore point. It can be where your developers do their testing. It can be all sorts of things The Purpose-built backup appliances are called purpose-built backup appliances because they're too slow to use for anything but backup. 
we are a general purpose storage system very well suited to backup but it's fast enough to use for day-to-day -day operations to run real applications. And that becomes handy in all sorts of things. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, oh, your main storage system blew up, restore to vast and run there for a year. You don't wanna run your primary system and it's backup on the same storage system unless the alternative is not running the primary system at all because backups alone have very limited value. Backups of running primary systems have huge value. And so for the days or weeks until I have a new system or until my old system gets released by the lawyers and gets sanitized by the manufacturer, then I can just storage vMotion these things to whatever my primary storage is and my users don't take an outage. You know, it's interesting. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Howard. I was just saying, I think that's the last slide. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually got a bunch of questions, I think, from that last slide. But uh, this question, the first question, this might be one for Dave. So uh, uh, the, they're saying um, the VAST isn't the only data protection target on the market. Uh, why is VAST uh, a good solution for Veeam? Uh, I, I think... Two reasons, I'm sure I could come up with more, but the two that jump out to me, if I was going to be a backup administrator or managing a backup solution, why would I care? And one is speed, right? It's not speed of ingest, it's speed of how fast you can present the data, meaning restore it. And, and Howard touched upon instant recovery. You know, Veeam can make a copy of that data available very fast, but we're gated by the infrastructure. You know, if, if the highway is congested, we can't go any faster. But as Howard just described, you know, the lanes are clear. You know, you're in the express lane uh, when, you, when you're on VAST. So it's speed, but it's also speed that's usable without superhuman effort. What I mean by that is everything that we've just talked about is configurable from the Veeam policy. You don't have to write scripts. You don't have to log into a VAST console, a Veeam console, go write some other code to kind of glue it together. No, it literally, it's, it's, I would say set it and forget it. That's the kind of policy from the moment you create the data through its useful life cycle to when you need to recover it to when maybe ultimately you've said that that data should be removed. That can all be pre-configured on day one. And but so- don't actually forget it. Yeah, you need you need to test continuously. Fair fair point, and you know Veeam can automate that as well uh, on your behalf, and you know we can prove that you're meeting your SLAs, and and Vast is a huge component of being able to do that. Again, it goes back to speed and reliability, and cutting out all of the opportunities for errors, the errors because people made a mistake, or errors because bad people tried to inject something in, in their process. So that's why I think VAS is a great target for Veeam. Sure, that makes sense. And I think it's only fair, uh, thanks Dave. And I think it's only fair for us to kind of pitch that question in reverse to Howard. You know, why is why is Veeam an ideal data protection solution? Um, primarily because Veeam is actually, you know, like VAST, Veeam is designed in a modern era. You know, the, the leading backup solutions were designed originally to back up Unix systems in the 80s. And they have all sorts of little bits of that history that haven't quite been erased. Veeam was designed from the very beginning to back up to disk, to back up VMs, to, to deal with the modern infrastructure. And so they do many of those things better. Um, you know, the, the we, we all too often think of backups as sequential copies of files going to some tape drive or something, some disk that's pretending to be a tape drive. But that's a 20 year old view. The data that you're acquiring from a VMware environment with change block tracking isn't sequential. By the time you've done incremental forevers at the block level for weeks, the rest the data isn't sequential any place, even without the complexities of deduplication being added. And so we need to have the 
a system that understands that and that is designed for a high enough speed back end to be able to deliver what we're talking about. You know, part of the problem with some of the traditional systems is since they were originally designed for tape, there are places where they just don't do random IO very well because nobody's fixed it yet because they were paying attention to backup speed, not restore speed. That makes sense. Yeah, we, we got time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, this one, uh, let me go to Dave here. So someone's asking, um, is, is Veeam just for SMBs or is it enterprise ready? Yeah, it's a good question. And the answer is both. And let me decompose that. In fact, my laptop, the same instance, Howard, of Veeam that runs on this Lenovo laptop is the same instance that one enterprise that I spoke with recently manages 20,000 VMs and eight petabytes of data. And the difference is my Lenovo laptop has a very, very simplified compute networking and, and storage stack compared to what they're running. Now I bet they have more than one instance too. They they actually do for a failover perspective, but with one copy of Veeam backup and replication, they can manage 20,000 machines. And the reason they can do that is because we're software based, we're software defined, right? If you give Veeam backup and replication premium infrastructure like VAST, we can perform incredibly fast. We can hit the kind of speeds that Howard was referencing. So while it's easy enough to deploy, I, I literally have the, the code deployed on my laptop. And there are many thousands of organizations that have it deployed in small businesses. But earlier this week, we had our customer advisory board and those 20 customers were all running multiple petabytes, if not dozens of petabytes of backup on, on Veeam. So that's why I say the answer is yes, that it can scale down, but it can scale up because it is software defined. We can deploy more worker engines to ingest data. And if you give us a fast landing zone and a fast ability to instantly mount to like fast, fast data in Veeam can perform incredibly well for organizations of very large sizes. Well, very well said. Um, all right, we have time for one last question. Uh, let's go with Howard for this one. Um, why do I need data reduction on the back end if Veeam is already doing deduplication? Well, to be perfectly honest, none of the backup applications do data reduction at fine granularity. And I would agree and with that. <laughs> that the the amount of compute you need and the amount of memory you need to do deduplication on 32K blo size blocks like we do is more than people are willing to pay for when they buy backup software for the server it's going to run on. And so the backup software vendors are all, they deduplicate on large blocks, which gets most of the benefit for a much smaller cost. And so if you send things that are deduplicated on big blocks to a system like ours that deduplicates on small blocks and then does similarity, we'll get a lot more reduction from it. And we're one reduction realm. So if you have multiple instances of Veeam run by different departments who don't like each other, or you organized your jobs based on roles, not how well your data is going to reduce, it gets fixed at the back end. Um, and then the part Dave won't like so much is in every large enterprise I've ever been in, there are three or four applications where the guys who own that application just refuse to let the backup guys use their application. You know, Oracle DBAs are the worst. Oracle DBAs want to dump their data to some NFS or S3 point. They don't want the backup software to touch it. And if the place you're dumping it does data reduction, now you reduce that data too. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Howard. Uh, you know, we're we're at we're at time for the webinar. In fact, we're a little over time. So thank you, folks, for thanks for you folks for, for bearing with us and joining us. But uh, I think that was just a great conversation. Um, but if you want to learn more, if you're if anything, you know, 
uh, you know, caught your ear during this webinar, uh, visit advancedata.com forward slash Veeam. You can find more details about our partnership. Uh, we also have a live chat on the site. So if you just want to connect with someone, you can connect with them that way. We'll also be following up with you after the webinar as well. Um, if you're interested in learning more, just feel free to respond. Um, but with that, you know, thank you so much, Howard. Thank you so much for Dave for joining us. And thank you for, thank you to all of you for, uh, for joining us this morning. Thank you. I had fun. Good to chat with you.